Hello, good evening and welcome to EU Training's online webinar, A Beginner's Guide to Situational Judgment Tests, uh, or SJTs as we're going to be calling them quite frequently this evening. Before we begin, a little bit of an introduction. My name is Robin Bott. I am a Chartered Occupational Psychologist and I specialise in assessment methods, so verbal, numerical and abstract reasoning, as well as SJTs. And over the past few years I've written hundreds of different SJT questions um, for many different companies, from small charities to major banks. Um, I've also trained people in how to write them and how to, how to tackle them, how to approach them, how to do their best at them. So the aim tonight is to, for this session tonight is to help you understand what is being asked and how to, how to think about a situational judgment test, how to respond to it. It's also to give you a little bit of experience uh, as, to, as to what it's like to, to uh, look at an SJT and what kind of things are going on underneath the surface. Um, this is a 30 minute recording introduction, so it's static. Um, that does mean that if there's anything that I cover too quickly, so I'm going to discuss some values and competencies later on, for example, and I might go through those quite quickly. Um, don't worry, because you can watch the recording afterwards, so just, just focus on kind of getting a general idea of what I'm saying, and then you can go back and check the details if you need to. Um, it's going to be very theory-focused, this beginner webinar, um, so I'm going to be talking about a lot of concepts behind situational judgment tests and SJT questions, rather than actually getting you to work through questions. Um, but we are going to follow this with a pro session which will have specific questions, it will have 10 specific questions to work through that we've built to give you an understanding of the range of different uh, types of questions you might have, you might, um, you might get asked. Now that session is going to be a bit more interactive, so there's going to be voting, uh, you're going to get to choose which response options you think are correct, um, and you're going to be able to ask me questions as well, but that is an add-on, so um, to attend that you will need to uh, pay additional extra. Um, so what we're going to look at in the beginning session though is how to approach questions and, and give you an insight into, into how SJT questions are put together and how to approach them and the pro session will be a bit, a bit of a chance to actually use those skills um, and try them out. So this slide gives you an overview of the EPSO SJT exam. Uh, it's 20 questions in 30 minutes and that equates to one and a half minutes per question. Now, unlike verbal, abstract, and numerical reasoning, the time limit isn't designed to be super stressful, and you're not, you're not supposed to be processing complex information very, very quickly. That's not what it's getting at. It's looking at how you respond to different situations. The reason a time limit is put on is just so that you don't overanalyze the questions. So they do want you to go with your kind of gut instinct, your, your, your what you believe to be the best approach, um, rather than rather than hyper-analyzing every single word. Um, the maximum score is 40, and we'll talk about how you get to 40 out of any 20 questions in a minute. Um, and there's a pass mark of 24, but you want to perform as well as possible on the situational judgment test, because it's going to be used, it's not just a pass or fail, that your score on the SJT is actually going to be considered alongside uh, other parts of your application to see whether you progress. So it's not just a pass or a fail, so you do want to perform as well as possible. Uh, and as, uh, as I mentioned, it's designed to measure your approach to the situation, not how quickly you understand the complex information. So the scenario should be relatively straightforward, um, and it's how you respond to them that's uh, the, what's being looked at. Uh, you cannot take anything into the exam room with you, but you don't need to. You don't need, say, a calculator. Or you don't need pen and paper for this particular questionnaire, this test. So this is the structure we're going to use tonight. I'm going to start by giving a brief overview of SJTs. Then I'm going to give you a little bit of insight into how they're scored, uh, how, how we believe EPSO uh, likely to score them. Um, it's not just a sort of... that. Um, then we're going to look at competencies and values. So these are things that underlie situational judgment tests. They help construct them and they help EPSO mark them and understanding them helps you understand how to approach an SJT, how to, how to understand what it's actually getting at. And then I'm going to give you some tips and tricks on how to take the test. So these two are very similar sections and they're looking at how you can approach an SJT, how you might be able to get the, the highest score uh, you mm -hmm. possibly can, how you can understand what's being asked and how you can... Uh, best represent yourself. So we're going to start with an overview of situational judgment tests. So um, very simply a situational judgment is how you judge a situation. So you're given a scenario 
and you've got to think how you would respond to that. And this maps on to how you would behave in different situations um, that, that, that would be typical kind of scenarios that, that, that you might have in the EU. So what they're looking for is do you behave in a way that is conducive with EU civil services ways of working? And what this looks like in detail is you're given a scenario, you're given a situation maybe of a paragraph or two, and four ways of responding to it. And you've got to choose from those four ways what you think is the most effective and the least effective way to respond. So you might say, oh, none of these are quite right, none of these are quite what I, I'd do, but you have to be able to pick out what you think would be the most effective um, and least effective from that list. And we've put here that it's a two-way assessment. And what we mean by that is you know, taking your abstract, your verb, your numerical, and you're thinking, well, this is interesting. I see what they're getting at. But it doesn't really give you, those, those don't really give you a flavor of the types of situations, the types of experiences you might have working in the EU. And SJT is great because the, some of the scenarios, the scenarios are designed to be very realistic, sometimes a little bit exaggerated um, to you know, really put you in difficult situations. But they're designed to give you an idea of the sorts of situations that you'll face when uh, working in the EU and ways you might consider responding to them. Uh, and again, just to, just to focus, these are different from verbal reasoning. So you're not expected to be interpreting complex information. You're not expecting to uh, kind of unwind clever words. What they're doing is, what they should be doing is giving you a very simple question and for simple ways to respond. And you should be choosing which of those you think would be the most effective way of behaving. So it's not about interpreting the scenario. Um, and understanding it uh, in depth, it's about it's about thinking about your your your, your kind of gut response to a situation and, and and how what would be the most effective way of responding. So, um, just in case uh, you don't know what I'm talking about when I talk about SJTs, uh, if still they're, they're still not clear to you, here's an example SJT. So this is the scenario we're talking about. Now, don't worry too much about solving this particular one. This is just to show you what they look like. But this is the scenario. Here are four different response options. So, for example, you could apologize and continue with the presentation, explain that you'll have to skim over some parts. Um, and here is the question itself. So please consider the situation you feel is the most effective and the least effective response or action from the four statements. So now we're going to talk about, now that you know what an SJT is, we're going to talk about how they're scored. So each set of four responses that um, you're provided with will have uh, most effective, uh, two middle options, and a least effective option. Now, generally speaking, when these are scored, the two middle options, one might be better than the other, um, but they're generally scored in the same way. So, so your, your task here is not to differentiate between these two middle options, but to, to spot the best option and the worst option um, and to select those. Now, unlike abstract, verbal, and numerical, there's a little bit of subjectivity to the answers. Um, so they can certainly be argued in, in, in places. Um, how EPSO will design their SJT and how strong SJTs are designed is that when the SJT is put together, it's trialed uh, among uh, existing employees or experts in, in what it takes to work in the EU. And we look for the what they pick out as the most and the least effective. So, there's no definitive right answer, and you know these these questions can change even from company to company. But what we'll have is uh, SJT. Each question will have been trialled extensively to make sure that the answer that they consider to be most effective, the answer they consider to be least effective, is a fair representation of what it takes to work effectively within the EU. Um, but that does mean that you're not going to be able to look at all four answers and necessarily go, yes, that's the answer, and I'm definitely certain of it. So talking about scoring now. Um, so we've got a very crude example here. In a one-to-one -one meeting, your superior is giving you lots of negative feedback. Some of the feedback seems unfair and is becoming upsetting. Pick the most and least effective answer. So what we try to do, if you try to make this reasonably obvious, um, I think this is probably easier than most situational judgment tests you'll get. Um, here we have shouting back at your superior and telling her some of her faults too as a very negative response. Uh, try to understand the feedback and then check your understanding with them as our most positive response. So we're going to, and we're going to highlight these answers as we uh, move through. So green, 
represents the, uh, the, the most effective as judged by uh, the EPSO panel, uh, EU employees, etc. And yellow represents the least effective. So for picking each answer as most effective, so say you selected this answer that we've decided is not good. Say when you went through this, you selected this as your most effective, you get zero points. Now, if you selected either of the middle answers as your most effective, they're not the designated most effective, but at least you've not gone completely wrong. So it's likely you're going to be re still rewarded marks for this, or not full marks, but just some recognition that you're, you understand that these are kind of adequate ways of responding. You, you might not pick the best way of responding, but you've not picked a terrible one. And if you try to understand their feedback, if you pick this most effective as your most effective, you get a whole point for this. So this is one point in total for your most effective choice. A similar thing happens for your least effective choice, um, but the other way around. So you get a whole mark for picking the least effective correctly and zero marks there for getting it wrong. And if you get that middle option, you're still going to get uh, you're still going to get some half marks. So in this way, each question is worth um, uh, two marks because you can get up to up to a mark for your most effective and up to a mark for your least effective. So notice as well that uh, with this scoring system, you get marks just for not getting it completely wrong. So if you're not entirely sure of how to answer a question, if you're not entirely sure what the best option is, it's still worth going with your best estimate because you might not pick up that whole mark, but you might get half a mark. Um, and a worked example here, um, our person correctly highlighted shouting at your superior as the least effective choice. So they got a full point here. But they thought that continuing the meeting, uh, but try not to take on board any of the feedback, not, not, a, not a great response, but better than shouting at your superior. Um, they picked that as their most effective, so they're going to get half a point there. So they're getting they're getting above half marks for that. And that's partly the reason as well why the, the pass mark um, is a little bit higher than half marks as well, because you can kind of you can claw in extra points even without getting the answer fully correct. <coughs> So I'm going to move on to competencies now. Competencies are bundles of behaviours that are thought to relate to job performance. Um, and many, perhaps most major organisations use them, for example, to help choosing tests during selection, to help write assessment centre exercises, and they can be used to monitor staff performance as well. So they can be used to set, set guidelines as to what kind of performance you expect, how well do you expect people to perform in a specific uh, competency. Now, we're going to look um, at EPSO-specific competencies now, but competencies are quite generic from company to company. So um, the first competency we're going to look at is working with others. Now, that's an important skill in working within the EU, but it's also important in most companies to be able to get, on, get along with others, to network well, to understand and support people when they're having difficulties, etc. Uh, there are eight EPSO competencies overall, and the SJT has five of them, um, and I'm going to run through those five now. So the first one, uh, as I mentioned, um, oh, and I should say as well, when I'm running through these, try and think about how they relate specifically to um, EPSO. So, so um, for example, working with others might be about working, uh, you might need to think about kind of working internationally because you might be working uh, between different countries. Um, and that's kind of different to working in a small office, for example, where you don't work with anyone, anyone else. Um, so working with others, um, as I said, it includes remote working, analysis and problem solving. So you're going to need to work with complex information. You're going to need to understand difficult concepts and you're going to need to have a, a mature approach to, to, to solving problems and, and understanding data. Now, reasoning tests are quite useful in for EPSO to measure these. So um, verbal, numerical, abstract, that can look at your skill in analysis and problem solving. So what the SJT is going to be looking at is your approach to problem solving. So do you challenge data given to you? Do you look for more data? Do you have ways of uh, do you have ways of looking for more data or do you just kind of take things at surface level? Delivering quality and results is about focusing on quality and, 
output, uh, meeting all of the all your different competing demands and, and performing well. So um, you'll begin to see that these are kind of useful in specific, uh, well, across all companies, but think about how they might be useful specific when you're working within the EU. Prioritizing and organizing, that's your planning competency. So that's about uh, being able to set plans, being able to change when, when with uh, changing plans, and being able to look ahead into the future rather than kind of just being reactive. And the final competency is about putting up with, is resilience. It's about putting up with the strains and the difficulties of certain situations. So those are often the uh, particularly negative SJT questions. Um, uh, you know, your slides going wrong when you're making an important presentation to, 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 to senior people. So these are our five EPSO SJT competencies. Now there's eight EPSO competencies overall. So across the process, if you go on to take E-trays and assessment centers, etc., they might also look at things like communicating, uh, learning and development, and leadership. But we're only going to focus on these five. Um, and essentially competencies, when you drill a bit deeper, they break down into what we call indicators. And these are what good and poor behavior by this competency looks like. So what does good working with others look like? What is uh, poor analysis and problem solving? What are, the, what are the, the factors there? And these indicators are used by people who are writing situational judgment tests in order to create um, options, um, to create scenarios as well, but, also, but specifically to create the options. So this is an example of uh, sets of indicators. So these are paired indicators in this case. So this competency framework has makes incorrect prioritization judgments. Uh, versus prioritizes tasks appropriately. So they're kind of opposite ends of the spectrum. Um, this is a very common way that uh, we break down competencies. Now I'm going to show you how that can be used to create a negative indicator. So, uh, sorry, a negative option. So let your team decide how to best achieve the goal so as to empower them. Uh, now, obviously, you don't have a scenario here, but you can see how um, it looks positive in some ways, but actually, um, it, you're not setting deadlines and milestones yourself. At the other end of the spectrum, set up a project plan, letting your team know what you need from them and when is an example of setting realistic deadlines and milestones. So competencies are used to guide these options. Now, you can't decide between these two kind of just on their own um, without the scenario, but hopefully that will give you the gist of the sorts of things you can be looking out for. So to summarize competencies, um, well, they're not as straightforward as um, uh, uh, as I guess I've, I've presented them so far because every question is always going to touch on quite a few competencies. So it's pretty difficult to write to, to have a question that's only about working with others, for example. But what you can do is try and spot competencies that are measured by the situations and the answer options provided. Um, sometimes you can identify that just from uh, just just from the answer options. Sometimes you don't even need to look at the scenario to understand kind of what competencies are likely to be being got at. So the example I just gave, for example, uh, you had answer options and I could identify them as uh, poor or, or, or strong planning without that. So thinking about competencies, trying to understand them and relating them to your SJTs is going to help you identify what is a good and uh, poor option. They are a good guide, however, because they're so complicated and because there's always going to be elements of things, even in your middle options and your distractors. Sometimes you'll have a little bit of uh, a little bit of one competency and a lot of another. So they're not a foolproof solution. But by spending time looking, trying to understand the uh, the, the competencies that are going to be measured, you're going to be in a good uh, position to to identify which options are are going to be considered effective and ineffective. So this is an example of how we can uh, how we can write indicators based on competencies. So you have been asked to lead a large project involving several given very little guidance. Um, and what we've done is we've come up with an uh, indicator for each competency. We actually haven't decided which of these indicators is best and worst, so there's no question here. But to give you an idea, meeting with people and working, working to identify an approach that works for everyone, that's a very working with others type competency. It's collaborative, it's supportive, um, and it's going to have the best outcomes in terms of working with others. Setting aside time to review the details. So analysis and problem solving answers 
um, are usually around trying to challenge data, trying to understand it better, not being scared, confused, moving away from data, not passing it on to somebody else. Uh, delivering quality and results, our example here is about pushing for quality outcomes, uh, encouraging people to do their best. Prioritizing and organizing here is about setting a project plan, making it clear what you expect um, from people and, uh, and giving specific deadlines. And the resilience is about so you can remain composed and calm. Uh, putting an extra effort is, is very good here, although that does overlap with uh, delivering. Um, but it's about remaining calm and focused and not being overwhelmed by difficult situations. So what we've done on this slide is to try and come up with some negative indicators based around uh, based around the competencies. So we've taken uh, we've taken examples of, of, of negative polls that we saw earlier and used those answers. So working with others, demonstrate your independence by creating a plan to assure you, to ensure you meet all your own goals. So what you might notice here, this is our this is a sort of least effective negative indicator option. But it's still written to be positive, um, and it draws a little bit on, I think, this one, uh, creating a plan. So it draws a little bit on another uh, competency, um, prioritizing and organizing, and, and kind of showing the strength of that. So this is where um, it's not as obvious as, as working with others. Uh, it's, not, it's not going to be a sort of uh, meet with everyone as your uh, positive. And don't bother meeting with everyone as you're negative. It's going to be cleverly worded. It's going to it's going to appeal as an answer option. So, so demonstrating your independence. Um, analysis and problem solving. So here we have asking a more experienced colleague to summarize the main ends of the project. So um, yes, it might be useful to uh, to draw on someone else's experience, but this is kind of handing it over. It's not taking on um, trying to understand the project in depth. It's getting someone to summarise it for you. Um, asking someone else to do it is quite often a, a, a negative response written in a way to make it seem positive. So use someone's expertise, use someone's experience. Um, delivering quality on results. Focus on meeting your key objectives quickly so as to remain efficient. So if this said meeting your key objectives quickly and effectively, it might be OK. Um, but here, there's a real risk that quite, if you're trying to meet your objectives quickly to be efficient, that you might overlook quality. So you see again, it's not a, it's not a, it doesn't, it's not very, very clearly negative. But if you look at it carefully, um, you can see that it's uh, not covering that competency. Prioritizing and organizing. So prioritize your other tasks first, and when these are done, start planning the project. No, you want to start talking to people and get things moving on the project itself. And asking your superior to write an effective plan for you. Um, this again is passing on work um, because something seems overwhelming. A common, as I said, a common distractor, a common weak answer, or at least middle option is get someone else to do it for you. So I'm going to talk about values now. Uh, I'm going to be reasonably brief over these, but values are described as shared beliefs or ideals about what is desirable or undesirable. So typically business values, uh, organizational values, are things like uh, integrity, maybe creativity and ethics, uh, profitability, these sorts of things. So they're a little bit more unique. They're a little bit more bespoke to an organization. Um, the important thing is they're thought to underlie everything the company does. So they're help, thought to build up its culture and affect the way people behave, what they're rewarded for, etc. Um, they're often less generic than competencies. So uh, I think creativity is a value. Now that's uh, that's a, that's a value in some companies. Other companies want something completely different. Um, in understanding what values the EU is looking for, we looked at a previous version of the Code of Good Administrative Behaviour. Now, when we were reviewing the most recent one, we actually found it had some principles in it as well, some new principles, which seem to apply a little bit wider than just the individual. Um, values do as well, um, but, but 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 we think that both the values and the principles can be applied to um, to SJT questions. So we're going to list these here. As I said, I'm going to go over these reasonably quickly, um, but you can watch the recording for, for further information. So hierarchy. So this is about uh, respecting your superiors, um, respecting your bosses, and um, 
also looking out for um, being being authoritative and giving clear command to, to, to people who you're responsible for. Um, loyalty to the authority ties in with uh, hierarchy to, to, to me at least. So again, it's about respecting the organisation, respecting um, those above you, doing as you're told, um, and rules and procedures very similar. It goes a little bit beyond that to um, there will be rules and procedures in place and you should be following those. So you're probably beginning to get a bit of a picture of the types of values that, that, that might guide a question. Um, it's important to be kind of doing as you're told rather than being massively proactive or, or, or being particularly stubborn when asked to do something if you don't believe in it. So equal opportunity, that's another value we have. Quality of service, and this starts to overlap with the competency as well, um, delivering quality and results. Public image, so you've got to be aware that uh, a lot of things that you do might be in the public eye, um, and that should judge your guidance, that should guide you when you're in the job, but also in how you'd respond to um, SJT questions. And work atmosphere, and to me, this is where it starts to overlap with, uh, again, with competency. So to create a good work atmosphere, the competency related to that is probably working with others. Um, so principles are a little bit broader, and they're supposed to be EU specific, but you sh they should also be used to help you kind of give a give an understanding of how you should behave as well. So commitment to EU and its citizens, uh, integrity. As I said, this is a common value, but it's particularly important when you've got a public image, when you're in the public eye. Objectivity, and what I mean by this is putting your personal values and politics aside for the benefit of the EU um, and the benefit of the projects you're working on. Um, respect for others, uh, again this is about working with others. Transparency is about letting people know and understand what you and the EU are doing, so kind of not hiding behind, uh, hiding behind what lies or, or, or kind of obscuring the truth, but about making these known. So to summarise competencies and values together, they're, they're a complex mix and what we're not saying is go away, memorise these and you'll be able to get full marks on the SJT. That's not the case. There's always a lot more subtlety to it. However, the more you work with the competencies and values, the more, the more you kind of think about them in relation to SJTs, the more they're going to help you get into the EU mindset, the more they're going to help you understand what each question is, um, is looking at and what's likely to be um, the agreed upon most and least effective ways to behave. And they also, you should think about how they interact. Um, so you can have all sorts of competencies and values per question, but um, think about which are the key ones for that particular scenario. And also bear in mind that if you become familiar with these, they're also likely to help you in your, if you, if you get later in the process with things like e-trays and assessment centers, because those also are based on the same competencies and views. So understanding them, again, will give you the understanding of what EPSO are looking for. So we're going to talk, uh, give a few pieces of advice on how to uh, take the test. So reasonably obvious one first, uh, read through the question and review the answer options and think about how they relate now to the competencies and values that we've discussed. So if you can see something that seems particularly planful, uh, particularly uh, collaborative, that suggests that those might be good answer options, for example. Uh, look for additional information in the question. So sometimes, uh, as I said, it's not a verbal reasoning, but sometimes there can be information that's just a little bit uh, hidden away, uh, a little bit you need to pay a little bit of attention to to fully understand the scenario. So here, you are giving an important presentation at a busy conference to a group of senior members when you realise your slides are not displaying properly. You're only about a quarter of the way through and have some difficult technical data that you wanted to present towards the end. There are several other significant presentations following on from yours. So throughout that scenario, little seeds of information have been put in that are important in understanding um, what you should do. So it's a busy conference and there's presentations following yours. So having, having your presentation overrun is unlikely to be a positive response. And this says you wanted to present towards the end, so it's not something that you seem to need to respond to. So again, this is a hint as to what you should do. And so just paying attention to the language and looking for clues can help you get a best, uh, the best understanding of what the answer will be. Uh, and consider worst case implications. So what would happen 
if you took a response option to its absolute extreme. So you are supervising a junior colleague who is working on a project over the next few months. He's a strong performer and is keen to work on a project alone. So what would happen if you let him work on it alone? Well, you're supposed to be supervising it and it risks it going wrong. So think about the extreme cases. What, could, what are the risks that are presented? Are they acceptable? Um, set up a meeting early on, the next option. That risks it going wrong, but you've got control in the first few weeks. So you, you at least know how it's going to start. So that's likely to be a slightly better answer option. Um, set up regular meetings throughout the project to monitor his progress. Excuse me, will help you stay on top of the project without stifling him. And the final option, taken to the extreme, you're micromanaging potentially, um, monitoring him closely when you know he wants to work on his own. So here it was about striking a balance, but the best way to solve that was to think about taking your answer options um, to the extreme. And what's the worst case scenario? Well, he might get frustrated um, and he might not perform, he might not use his initiative and expertise. Um, so incidentally, the C we consider to be the best answer for that. Um, I'm going to give you a few more tips and tricks. So as we've already said, think about the competencies and values. Um, think about how they, the answers relate to them. Think honestly about how you'd respond. And then also think about how the EU would want you to respond to the situation. So the questions are asking, what do you think would be the most and least effective uh, responses? Think about yourself in the role. Think about how you could be going the extra mile and, and, and really performing to your best. And, and relate those answer options uh, to... to, to well, relate your understanding there to the answer options provided. Um, review the information carefully, but try to go to, with, with your instincts. So these aren't designed as trick questions. That So the thing that seems like the best way to go, that, that sort of go out and talk to all your colleagues and try and understand what's going on, is likely to be better than bury yourself away and don't, don't do the work. So, so, so try and go with your, your instincts and try not to spend too long on the questions. Um, as we say, think through the outcomes of options, take them to the extreme, it um, can give you an idea of what could possibly go wrong. Um, don't be misled by the wording alone. So I think we had a few examples as we went through of negative indicators, uh, negative options, sorry, with quite positive wording. And sometimes the same can be done the other way around as well. Sometimes the best answer is given soft language, given um, not very strong terms, and that can make it off-putting. So try to think about the concept behind the answer rather than just does it have, uh, does it have certain words that make it look um, exciting? Does it say take the initiative? Um, well, that looks exciting, but would that be appropriate in this case? Um, and look for weak answers. So commonly SJTs, um, when, when the writers have to come up with a lot of answers, they'll have to, they'll have, to have some that are just a bit a bit unexciting and aren't going to kind of progress things. So, so very common ones are desk research. So take this problem on yourself and try and crack it um, rather than speaking to other people, asking for more information, etc. Um, and asking someone else is a very common one as well. So um, asking your superior, getting your superior to do something for you is likely to be a poor option. Now, that doesn't mean don't check ideas with your superior. It means don't it means, you know, at least take the initiative. So, for example, draft draft a response and run it past your superior is a lot better than saying, I don't know to your superior, can you do it for me? Um, and practice is our final point. Um, and you might find it particularly useful to practice with the competencies and the values by your side. Again, I say they're not a, they're not a cure or they're not a perfect solution, but what they should do is help give you that insight into the types of questions that are going to be asked. So that's the end of the beginner webinar. So there's going to be, uh, as I say, a pro webinar to complement this, where we're going to work through um, example questions spread across the five different competencies. And there's going to be opportunities to ask me questions, um, ask, ask, ask us questions, I should say. Um, so if you're interested, I would recommend signing up for that. Um, but I want to say to everyone who's attended this, thank you very much and best of luck. Uh, in your EPSO application.